I'll start the webinar now. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, this month's edition of the DSSE Insight Series, which is the monthly webinar series from the Data Spaces Force Center. So this this month we're uh, we're dealing with a very interesting topic, which is how to accelerate green transition with data spaces. Where I have three illustrious guests that will will delve into the topic. I have uh, Professor Boris Otto from the uh, director of the Fraunhofer Institute. I have uh, I have here. Uh, Seb Sebastian uh, Danville, which is the which is the um, forecast analyst at the European Center for the Medium Range Weather Forecast, and then I will have the uh, Elizabeth Knudsen uh, from the uh, who is the deputy coordination of the European Data Space for Smart Communities. After this, uh, after the presentations, we will have a, a Q and A session in which you will have the chance to write in the chat all your questions about the about this webinar. And before I hand the floor to to Professor Borisotto, I have a two a couple of announcements from the Data Spaces Support Center. The first one is that uh, we have uh, the Data Space Support Center has a newsletter which I invite all of you uh, to subscribe to stay up to date with all our activities. And most of all, that we are very proud that the, our flagship yearly event, the Data Spaces Symposium for 2024, is, uh, is uh, starting very soon. And uh, it's, we will, uh, it will take place from the 12th on the 14th of March at the Darm Stadium. And you can click on the link uh, on the link in this uh, in the presentation to uh, pre-register and stay always up to date from when the official registration start. So, without further ado, I leave I leave the floor to Boris, uh, so Boris can give a good introduction to the topic. Perfect. Thank you very much, Anna, and also a warm warm welcome to everyone, um, to all um, the data space enthusiasts out there. Um, great uh, to have you all back here in this um, version of the uh, DSC Insights series. Um, I would like to touch upon a couple of things just to let you know and then also hand over the floor pretty quickly to um, the juicy stuff, um, which are the data spaces itself, of course. Um, but first of all, let me uh, report a little bit to you um, from some, let's say, news from the from the DSC project. So. Uh, you know that regularly we meet in a general meeting, so where the entire project comes together and um, the um, the most recent uh, version of these uh, meetings took place last week here in Dortmund. So we had a great um, three days even, or I believe two or three days even, um, with, let's say, lots of, let's say, workshops and, and, and meetings. And I would like to give you a brief update about, let's say, our key, well, focus topics. So first of all, we focus on the assets that we're going to produce as a data space support center um, for you to take up and to make your life easier because you guys are our customers, if you may. Um, so you should benefit from, let's say, the, the results that we produce. And I would like to touch upon um, one of the key um, assets that we are driving forward, which is, which is the, the blueprint. So the blueprint is some sort of a cook recipe for uh, for data spaces, so um, assuming or ex let's imagine you would be tasked, well, your data space architect of data space X, Y, Z, and then you celebrate a little bit over the weekend with your friends and family about your new uh, the, the new position that you got. But then, of course, we all know Monday comes and then you're sitting in the office like at 8.30 or 9 o'clock. And then you ask yourself, well, great thing. I have now the lead architect of a data space initiative. Uh, what does it actually mean and where do I start and how how should I move ahead? And that's what the blueprints are for. Um, we published um, version 0.5 last or September. And now the um, version 1.0, so the first uh, full version, so the, the a big uh, release, so to say, uh, is around the corner, which will be also presented in the um, in the next uh, data space um, symposium that Anna was uh, was mentioned uh, uh, was mentioning recently, um, and that will be let's say even more you know uh, focused on the user needs and also will uh, make a couple of let's say also well connections linkages to concrete technologies that are can be used in order to 
to implement the building blocks, which are part of the blueprint. So similar like legal blocks. Um, so the second thing is um, that we focused on in the plenary, but not only in the meeting, but let's say in the course of the project is the user. And um, because we felt that, let's say, over the last years, there has developed a certain level of complexity when it comes to data spaces. What is it all about? We have um, Gaia X, we have the IDS Association, we have the DSSC, and then we have things like the Data Space Business Alliance. And what this is all, um, let's say, good for in the sense of a certain user um, story. And, and that is something that we would like to stress in the future more prominent that we focus everything what we do on let's say the user stories and um, I talked about that the other day that of course in a data ecosystem based on a data space we have different roles so different sides of users but of course we always have let's say data providers right so companies um, that basically engage and participate in a data space in order to share their data and um, to give you an example how that looks like I mean Principally, um, if we cut down all this complexity, it's pretty simple. So uh, it's basically eight steps that are relevant um, for you as a data provider being part of a data space. So first you need to register um, so that you basically uh, behave to the rules and commit to the 10 commandments of that data space. And if you pass this process, then you get a digital certificate which identifies you and, and authenticates you. So second thing is um, you might want to publish a data a data source, right? So that's the second step. So you use a certain catalog, which is probably um, built on the DCAT format. So the third thing is um, request for the use of data are exchanged. So there's another guy in the data space that actually wants to use your data. So you need to handle, let's say, requests and respond to them. And that's been done by the data space protocol in many cases. Um, so then you need to negotiate usage conditions under which conditions would you allow a third party that requests your data um, to use it. So this is process number four, which is basically the, well, the negotiation of the data usage contract, if you may, and that's also stored in ODRL, also a accepted uh, W3C standard. So next thing is actually that you would like to exchange the data, which you can use any kind of, let's say, protocol, HTTP or MTTQ and whatever is out there. Um, and you would also like to be able to, um, of course, trace um, where the data flows to and where it comes from, so provenance things, which will also be part of the data space protocol. And well, the last thing then is actually using the data, right? So it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's like eight steps and that's it. Right, um, and that's what let's say data spaces are for for data providers. And as I said, in Darmstadt we will also present let's say um, these kind of well easily digestible user stories coming from a real world problem in order to make sure that you know what you get from where and how you navigate through this complex environment. Um, I should almost stop here because I don't want to steal too much time from as I said the juicy part of this um, this uh, session. Um, I'm really um, happy that we have uh, two experts here, two leads of one of the, I would say, most important data space endeavors in Europe. Why? Well, because they affect all of us. Um, on the one hand side, Sebastian will report about the about the great project, which is about the Green Deal, as you can see behind us in this wallpaper. And then Elisabeth will talk about the European data space for smart communities. Um, which, as I said, affects us all because we all live in a community. So that's that's really um, close by, and I'm I'm really looking forward to to listen um, to what they have to say. I close um, with again um, some commercial, so to say, for the data space symposium. So be engaged, uh, be there. I should say that Darmstadt, for those of you who are not so familiar with the map of Germany, Darmstadt is very close to Frankfurt and there's a direct bus connection from the Frankfurt airport terminal, where by the way, also the railway station is located. So a direct connection from that place to the Darmstadium. So if you get on the bus, buy a ticket, 40 minutes later, you are in front of the Darmstadium. So don't miss this opportunity. And with saying that, I'd like to hand over the word, I think directly to Sebastian. Anna, what do you think? We move the word to, to Sebastian. Yes, thank you. And Sebastian, the, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you, Boris. Sebastian, you feel free to share the screen. Yes. yes. So you should now see my screen. 
that should now be full screen. Okay, so thank you, Boris. Thank you, Hannah, for uh, for setting the scene. Sorry, so, Sebastian, you have to flip it over. We're seeing the presenter view. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, so yeah, thank you for setting the scene. So, uh, and thanks for the invitation to to present you the the Green Deal Data Space Roadmap that the that the great project I've been uh, I've been preparing. So what are we up to today? So I would like to give you a flavor of what the Green Deal data space could be, uh, give you also a flavor of uh, our roadmap principles, the principles we have been using to, to build and, and prepare that roadmap. And of course, getting ready to hear uh, your thoughts about it. So the, the, the great project, okay, so it's, a, it's a European project under, under the Digital Europe program. It's a coordination and support action, 18 months, 11 partners. Uh, it will end soon. And uh, what I'm presenting today has been delivered to the European Commission at the end of, uh, of last year. That's the first version of the roadmap. And there will be an update uh, of, the, of that roadmap by, by the end of the project. And uh, the, the update will mainly take, in, take into account all the comments we will receive. And we'll expand on, on some topics that I will talk about uh, later. So the Green Deal data space really, is, it's, at the, it's at the crossroad of two transition. The, the digital transition driven by the European data strategy and the, the Green Deal transition uh, driven by the, the policies uh, made by, uh, by the Green Deal. So that those two uh, transition and really this, this specific place at the crossroad of those has been important to help us uh, driving this roadmap. So the Green Deal before and, and for most, it's, it's a policy. With, with three main uh, three main aspects. One is the, the biodiversity strategy by 2030. Another uh, pillar is the zero pollution action plan, zero pollution for atmosphere, soil, and water, being the ocean or, or the river, and the climate change adaptation uh, strategy. And because those are policies, one of uh, our work has been to, to, to study their, their objectives and actually all those policies have binding targets, uh, meaning measurable uh, binding targets. That, that's what we were interested in. So uh, I will give two examples. So one is for the urban ecosystems. So one of the targets is no net loss of green urban space by 2030 and an increase in the total area covered by green urban space by 2040 and 2050 with measurable targets for those increase. Uh, for example, we will need we would need eight million trees uh, planted in the in the cities of, of Europe. Uh, it has two benefits: one for biodiversity, but also one to mitigate climate change. Also to uh, to try to mitigate the, the urban heat island effect uh, when uh, heat waves are are hitting Europe. And you can imagine there are there are many ways to add eight million trees in Europe. So, so here there is also room for, for many, many studies, many decisions that, of course, we would like to be based on, on data. Another example uh, for the agricultural ecosystems, uh, we call it the, the butterfly index uh, and farmland birds. We want an increase in the grassland butterflies because they are a marker of healthy soil. And, uh, and uh, scientific literature has shown that healthy soil are much better at capturing carbon. So uh, making sure that butterflies can proliferate together with bees and another kind of, of insect and, and birds it is important. In the sense, it is a marker of soils that will help us to, to mitigate climate change. But as you might imagine, it's also not, not trivial <laughs> to measure the population of, of, of those. And so there are about 80 to 100 biting targets uh, in the Green Deal. And we thought this could be really our, our our main object to, to start and to kickstart that Green Deal data space to, to make sure that we, we can build uh, use cases uh, around those uh, from early on. And then hoping that doing so, we will also aggregate more and more use, case, use cases and, um, and users and data providers, data users down the road. So for those indicators, you can see that well, we have seen, we have made a review for some of them. So here, this is for the butterfly uh, index. 
uh, that there is a consensus, a scientific consensus for some of those index, but for some, there is no scientific consensus. It's not yet clear how to measure that, especially for pollution, where it's very, very difficult. So you have two components. For some index, there is a scientific consensus. For some others, there is no. And then for the data, for some index, you have access to the data that are used to compute the index, index being then used to make a decision. So for some, you have access to the data, and for some others, you don't have access to the data. So this already gave, gave us a matrix that can drive different use cases from no scientific consensus, no data, to scientific consensus and data accessible. So it helps us to drive and to structure uh, our different uh, potential use cases during the implementation of the Green Deal data space. So now I will go on the, the principles that, that really emerge uh, based on our discussion with different stakeholders and uh, different user forums that we have been organizing. So number one, uh, creating a Green Deal data space, it's more than just assembling the necessary resources. That's, that's important, but it, it won't get you there just with this. Number two, uh, the mere construction of, the, of a sophisticated and technically impeccable data space is, in, is really insufficient. It is important, but uh, we, we need more to make this uh, a success. And number three, uh, at the beginning and, and during the evolution of the data space to really be people-centric, meaning because we don't know yet what it will look like in five years from now or even in, in two years from now. So we are going to build this. And, and to do so, we need to consistently align the future state solution with the perspectives and the preference of the individual who will interact with it. Because we, we, made, uh, the, we, we made the observation that when you try a new system or when you try a new product, you will make, if you have a disappointment or if you have a difficulty, if you cannot overcome it relatively quickly, then you will move on to something else. So we want people to come and to try and to stay. And, and for that, they need to feel that they are heard and listened to and that, that they can make progress. And that's really, really important. And uh, so all those uh, principles were, were used and kept in mind to build the, the roadmap and how we will organize the work. Another principle, so we have two, two terms important here. One is um, trials and pilot. So in a trial, uh, activities will be conducted to verify the functionality. It needs to work, okay? <laughs> the technicalities are important. They need to work. They need to do what they are supposed to do, but they, they won't make everything. The second one is the pilot, where you are using those features, those functionalities, uh, including business relationship and where you demonstrate an added value. On the Green Deal data space, using it, you need to be able to demonstrate you, you add value, you are able to, to build valuable product. One definition of valuable product would be, for example, it's just one, okay, I can take a decision based on this data, based on this um, downstream information. And this needs to be exemplified and uh, exercised. So for that, we have <clears throat> clusters around our different, uh, strategy uh, derived from the Green Deal. So biodiversity cluster, zero pollution cluster, climate change cluster. For each of those cluster, we would like public, private, small, large, data provider, data user, a broad range of diverse users, representative of the, of the landscape to inform the, the development of the, the, of the data space. And also two large initiatives. So the, the European flagship destinationers that is building a digital twin of the earth, and also the different Copernicus services that are really the, the Europe's eyes on Earth and that are really relevant for environmental uh, studies. And now the roadmap. So this is the high-level roadmap that we have been uh, proposing to the, to the European Commission. So at the top, you will see the timeline. It goes from January uh, 2025. It runs for three years. It's compatible with the current Digital Europe Work Program. And the fact that the, imp the implementation call for that data space should be uh, should be online, yeah, this year and uh, should start, and the implementation should start next year. It's relatively classic. So at the top, you will see that for a roadmap, you you start in a given state, you have a target state at the right hand side, and you have different steps that 
that gets you to that to that state. Uh, pretty classic as well, the KPI. It's like a measure of how far you are from your target. So for that, we have two, two, two big families, the trials. It needs to work technically and the pilot when you exemplify uh, the added value. And behind those, we will have series of trials, series of pilots informing um, the development of the, of the data space. And at the bottom here, you have the, the pillars. So this is, this is classic in the data space <laughs> development domain. Uh, we all had to work with the, the governance and the business model, the high value data set that will be part of the data space, the technical blueprint. And we added two of them. One is the onboarding, how you, you get people to, to use and to contribute to the data space. And one is the delivery, uh, as uh, it, it needs to be operational at some point. And uh, uh, this needs to be managed uh, per se. I won't go into too much detail. Um, here, I will just highlight yeah, that aspect here for the onboarding with the architect and data engineer support. And that's really relevant, I think, for what the, the data space support center is doing, is that <clears throat> when people, organization, individuals, uh, SMEs, institutions are willing to, to try and contribute to a data space, uh, you need to find architect and data engineer that will guide you, that will understand what is it that you want to do that you can provide, and that will guide you to reuse what has been working so far, or if it's really new, that will inform the, the new development. It's really classic with the, the hyperscaler uh, cloud providers and their offer. You have those architects and data engineers that are there to, to help you uh, jump in so that you can hit the ground running pretty quickly. And I, we, we think in the project that this is really important to, to maintain engagement and to create a community. So we will put some focus on that. We recommend to put some focus on that, meaning some resources, some investment also to make sure this part is, is well covered. That slide is more of a, of a metaphor of what a roadmap could be in the onboarding, where you have sort of two versions of the onboarding. So on the left-hand side, uh, from bottom to top, uh, at the beginning, you have many parallel streams running, many trials, many pilots. You have failures. You have success. You need to learn from it. And then by the end of the roadmap, which is at the, at the top of the, of the picture, then you have, you have managed to to take into consideration all those contributions into the mainstream of the operation of the, of the data space. So on the left-hand side, you have a really, really complex <laughs> setup with many contributions. And on the right-hand side, maybe a more manageable and <laughs> easier, easy flowing uh, process. We don't know yet where we will be, but we need to be prepared to, to one of those two scenarios. And uh, because it's hard to, to foresee the future, right? So we, we need to be prepared to, to handle many different parallel uh, activities. So the, the very important um, uh, streams <laughs> that we will, we will be working with uh, for that for the implementation that we are proposing to, to work with. So first policy alignment when um, uh, when choosing and working with use cases and, and participants, ensure that uh, data integration efforts align with national and international policies related to environmental conservation and climate action, because this is the Green Deal data space. Uh, governance and sharing agreement. So for that, of course, we are closely following the, the building blocks and uh, the blueprint of the data space support center. That is something important. Uh, you need to be able to share your data on your own terms, uh, being uh, free for reuse or uh, against compensation. So. This needs to be really clear and, and, and enforced by, by clear policies and by, uh, and by an operational uh, infrastructure. Collaborative research project. Within Digital Europe program and within Horizon Europe program, there are many, many projects that, that are relevant for what we are doing here. Uh, we need to, to make use of them. We need to connect to them. And they need to be able to, uh, to contribute and to, uh, to exercise the, the Green Deal data space. So this needs to be organized. Data discovery and catalogs, obviously when, when, when that data space will kickstart, this will be the, 
the the major and the, one of the most important features to have quite early on to have a, a data discovery platform or catalog indexing data set from both vertical but also horizontal and, and cross-cutting ecosystem making it easier to locate relevant data and once you have located the relevant data being able to to harmonize those data so to have the tools and technology to harmonize the data and transform them so that you can align data from different ecosystems making integration more efficient we will have a a, a subset uh, yeah a core set of standards that we that we will support this is very likely but still um, harmonization and transformation is is still very important to reach out more broadly when you when you share your data and finally <laughs> that will be my last slide to recognize and incentivize data providers, data users, and organizations that really actively contribute to the data integration effort. Uh, the community aspect, as I said, people-centric, it's important. So awards, grants, and acknowledgement uh, will definitely encourage uh, participation and needs to be organized uh, yeah, during the implementation. And if you want to know more, we will have a, a final uh, stakeholder forum, uh, the 13th of January, from 2 to 4.30 CET. So please scan to register if you want to, um, to dig uh, deeper into the, the Green Deal data space. Thank you. I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, thank you for the insight. Um, to the attendees, feel free to keep asking and commenting in the chat. We will deal with, uh, with all the questions in the in the final q a session now it's my pleasure to leave the floor to elizabeth so you can elizabeth feel free to, sh to share the screen and the floor is yours thank you just have to unmute myself uh so representing the european data space for smart communities or uh, what is also known as smart cities uh, I would like to start with a brief introduction of myself. So my name is Elisabeth and I work at the Technical University of Denmark in a group called Connecting Communities. And together with my colleagues, uh, we are coordinating the deployment of the European data space for smart communities. And uh, my background is in uh, social sciences, more specifically within global development. And I used to previously work at another department at DTU uh, focused on biosustainability, but joined the group, um, the Connecting Communities group, just a few months back. Um, so I'm maybe one of those who's also still learning what a data space really is. Um, but luckily, I have many talented colleagues in the project uh, who are very experienced within the field. So by joint efforts, uh, we launched this action just in October last year. So uh, as the, the great project is uh, finishing, we're just starting up actually. And we have had some very busy and interesting first months, but uh, more to come uh, on that. So today I'll start off by explaining the, the aim and scope of uh, the project or the action itself. Uh, going from the preparatory action towards deployment. Uh, you can see in, in the figure I have here. So I'm very sorry, sorry for the acronyms. Uh, I think GREAT is a better acronym than <laughs> the s uh, which is not easy to pronounce. But in the yellow box, you can see the, the preparatory action was uh, finished in September last year. It uh, lasted for one year. And then uh, we have uh, taken over in the deployment in the white uh, box, diamond, uh, if you will. Uh, and the point in the deployment is to uh, validate the blueprint that was developed in the preparatory action and also to provide with the data space provisioning uh, to be able to both validate and uh, finally make the transition into having um, a data space available for the for the smart communities. Um, after that, I will also explain a bit how the Green Deal fits into this uh, vision uh, of ours and how we seek to implement it in, in practice. And then I will touch a bit upon uh, the landscape of the action and the importance of the MIMS, the, the minimal interoperability mechanisms, uh, to then, and if I have enough time, 
uh, to take you through some of the outputs of the preparatory action and to present the open call for pilots, uh, which we just announced last week in uh, during the OS conference in Rotterdam, uh, and also yesterday actually during our stakeholder forum uh, meeting. Uh, so this is uh, kind of a big deal in our project uh, right now. Uh, but first off, as I said, uh, we are going from the preparatory action towards deployment. Uh, obviously, we are both funded by the Digital Europe program. Um, and our aim is to build uh, essentially a large-scale cross-sectorial data space for smart communities uh, within the EU. And uh, also very importantly to advance the its implementation to support the policies uh, uh, for this to be prioritized by cities and communities also within the EU. And all of this will be done by validating uh, the blueprint, uh, which includes uh, the governance scheme, uh, building blocks, reference architecture, and uh, much more. And the way we'll do this is by selecting uh, 10 to 12 pilots uh, who will uh, validate the proposed approach and the components in uh, real use cases, uh, which is relevant for them and then essentially relevant to all of us. Um, and by means of this validation, uh, the blueprint will be updated for the future deployments of the data space. So actually the input is, is uh, very important so that we have uh, one thing is what we can come up with in theory, but another thing is practice. So we really want to gain all of this um, this information uh, of how they implement it in, in real life cases uh, so that we can adjust um, accordingly. We have a three-year project. So as I mentioned, it started in October and it will last all the way until 26. And the reason why we have three years is that we want to, or we need time to implement the, the pilots with the with the use cases, uh, which will set off in three different batches uh, throughout these next couple of years. Um, so that's why we need time to uh, gather this information. Uh, so more generally speaking, and to think to take things up a notch, uh, it's also crucial to have a look at the vision. For the action and how it taps into the legislative landscape of the EU, uh, and also why it's relevant to discuss today, is that uh, the vision, the overall vision of us, is to have a well-governed data space that is available for developers and infrastructure providers to, de to deliver on the prospect of the of the digital decade of Europe. Um, and we believe that data fills our society already. Uh, the same way that water and food supplies, for example. Uh, but we had very long time to uh, to adapt uh, to those flows. But it's new uh, this thing with data, and uh, that's why we have to now address it in in a similar and sensible and sensitive way. Um, and we have a saying uh, that uh, bad data kills good services and bad services may kill people, the planet and the prosperity of communities on all levels, uh, which might seem like a bit of an overstatement, but nevertheless, it has uh, some some truth in it, just to be uh, slightly provocative. Um, but uh, what is uh, special about the data space for the smart communities that we're building uh, is that it's different from the some of the other data space projects, uh, meaning that uh, we have uh, not a focus on one single domain, but it's cross uh, domain. Uh, so it focuses on these two sectors or, or profession. Um, and that in that sense, it also uh, resembles a bit of uh, the great project that was just presented and also the Destination Earth project, uh, which is also part of the data space uh, family. But as mentioned previously, we're looking for uh, pilots, uh, real life pilots to test out the blueprint within the focus areas relevant to the European Green Deal. Uh, so when saying that uh, they have to be cross domain, uh, we mean that when they apply to become a pilot uh, and they form the scope of, of the pilot, 
they will have to incorporate at least two uh, Green Deal domains. And I have listed some uh, in the slide here. Um, and the reason why they have to do this is to increase the value of the data space. Uh, so it also exists, uh, and it will also exist of both uh, existing local data uh, and relevant stakeholders, um, as well as a list of priority data sets, uh, both real-time and historic with this cross-domain uh, significance. And also they have to be linked to environmental and climate related uh, challenges. So this is how it will actually be implemented in practice in our action is uh, through these pilots. And so generally creating the uh, technological as well as the governance uh, conditions for data access, uh, sharing and collection of uh, by smart communities in the, in, uh, in the EU. It uh, contributes to the goals formulated in the in the European Green Deal, uh, because data is an a very important enabler for uh, sustainable and data driven solutions, uh, to contribute to the goals of the zero pollution, for example, or uh, traffic management, or or what have you, climate, uh, and extreme weather uh, events to to prevent uh, the risk of these. Uh, so this is something that we will pursue through the, the use cases and encourage to have as a focus during the entire phase of uh, validating the blueprint. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a bit about how we see the landscape surrounding the action. Uh, as you can see, we're part of a larger landscape which laid some of the foundation uh, for a digital Europe, also supported by the Digital Europe program. Uh, first, it supports the building of data spaces across sectors. Here is uh, sort of three layers where you collect uh, the data and then you uh, might collect it into data spaces on various levels. It could be local, national or uh, at the EU level where our project and the great um, project is also uh, located. Um, and um, this is also where we have the entire data space uh, family, um, which we are part of and also uh, working closely together with the data spaces support center, obviously. Uh, that's also why we're here today. Uh, and especially the work we're doing with them is on the cross-sectoral aspects such as uh, minimal interoperability, interoperability sorry, which is uh, very crucial uh, to consider if the applications or services that you have on the top layer uh, in this figure, if they, if they can even benefit from, from these data spaces. If not, they cannot uh, uh, talk to each other. Um, and then up in the top, we have the uh, Sitcom AI, the TEF. It's the uh, Testing and Experimental uh, Experimentation Facility, uh, which we're also uh, coordinating uh, at DTU, actually. Uh, it's across sectors to have an artificial uh, intelligence-driven uh, solution to make use of all of the available data uh, from, from the data spaces. We also have the digital twins, um, Cityverse, and then we also have, and it's not in the figure, but we also have the, the eddies. So all of these European digital innovation hubs, uh, which the idea is that they have been set up to be one-stop shops uh, to support companies and public sector organizations to respond to the various digital challenges that they might uh, experience. So this is also to say that we're not alone uh, in this world, not at all. Uh, and it's very crucial for us to be working together with the other data space projects, uh, as well as the data space support center and also all of the other uh, actions that are funded through uh, Digital Europe, um, various others as well. And that is through ensuring these uh, minimal interoperability. Um, so I think I have a bit more time, then I will just say a few words about uh, the preparatory action. So that was the action uh, that already ended, but uh, where the blueprint was developed. And uh, the title of, of that action is a bit different than ours, but it resembles. And they have the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities. We just shortened it 
little bit. And the goal in that actually was to create a data space blueprint for smart communities as an enabler of the EU Green Deal goals and sustainable development goals. So that is why it really comes into action from the blueprint towards uh, the pilots uh, who will implement this blueprint. As I said, it was a one-year action. Uh, the website is live. We will continue on uh, with the same website, actually, but it has to be updated. Um, and everything, all the experiences that they made in the preparatory action was uh, evolved around the stakeholder forum. So they did a lot of interview surveys, workshops, uh, stakeholder forum meetings uh, to collect these uh, best practices and then eventually to, to come up with... Uh, with the best possible blueprint. Um, also to say that this was not created uh, alone by ourselves. Uh, it's of course around the stakeholder forum and with the co-creation of the great, uh, the sitcom that I mentioned, and also living in EU movement. Uh, first, our our initial name for the project was, was actually data spaces in EU to kind of emphasize uh, the, the close relationship with the living in the EU. But we had to change the name because obviously we're not the only data space project um, in the world. So we had to make it more specific. But just to say that uh, this is the, the family that this is built around also again towards uh, the MIMS. What was formulated in the blueprint was a technical part and a non-technical part. So there's a whole uh, governance part uh, with a multi-stakeholder data governance scheme. And then we have the technical part, which uh, consists of a catalog of uh, data space building block specifications, a reference architecture model, and a cookbook. Uh, and just to mention, I think my time is up, but uh, we actually just announced uh, the, the open call for pilots, uh, as I said last week, yesterday. So uh, in a couple of months, the uh, applications will open to apply to become a pilot. Uh, we are searching for these 10 to 12 uh, pilots and we have 15 million euros to hand out, which means that every single pilot will get between one and one and a half million euros, but they have to provide at least 50% of co-financing. So in the end, the entire budget will amount to two to three million euros which they have twin, uh, 12 to, to 16 months to, to use and deploy the, uh, the blueprint. And as I said, the feedback from these pilots will validate the blueprint that was developed. I think that was 45 seconds uh, above my time, so I will stop my presentation here. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you again, uh, Sebastian. Uh, so there were a couple of questions from the audience. One, I think, was already addressed by Sebastian, but or maybe Elizabeth want to have a, a say into it. So there was a question from Haluk, which says, how are companies that participate into these pilots will be selected? So they have to form a, a consortium. So in this consortium, we have to have at least two member state countries, EU member state countries. And from each country, they have to form a, a pilot site. You can have more sites in one country, but at least one. And in this site, uh, one local public authority needs to be uh, a part of it. So if a company wants to join uh, and apply to become a pilot, uh, they need to find someone to partner up with. And they need to have um, some sort of work with uh, the local uh, authority or administration. They can be the, the leading role, uh, but they have to have these uh, public authority in bigger or, or minor role. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think there's also another question from the audience, uh, which has not been addressed by either of you, so feel free to pitch in. Um, so is it possible for other cities outside of the EU to participate, or at least for best practices? Does this relate to the open calls that I mentioned? I yes, guess. I think so. I think so, because it came exactly in the moment to... Yeah, you were, so you it were... has to be from, from within the EU, because this is uh, launched from the Digital Europe program, so we're very EU-specific. 
So uh, to, to my understanding so far is that they can join, but they cannot get any funding. Um, and also uh, a company, uh, it's worth mentioning that if it's owned by a non-EU country, they cannot participate either. It has to be owned by uh, someone within the EU. Thank you. So I, I see another question from, I think, Natalie, uh, why two member states? Uh, why could it be, could it be uh, industrial vertical focus? So this is something that was very important from the commission from, from the start when, when even formulating the calls for these actions and projects is that uh, the cross-sectorial focus. Uh, so that is why we have to, to have uh, at least two uh, member states. They can have a different focus, but they have to be able to work together in, uh, in the scope and formulating uh, the pilot. But the idea is that they can benefit from, from each other and uh, work together. So this is also a way to show that um, the blueprint does not only work in uh, Brussels, but it might also be working in um, a smaller town um, in a rural area in another country uh, um, or something else. It's just an example. So that's the idea behind having at least two member states. Okay, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm waiting to see if there's other questions from the audience, but I don't see it. So yeah, with a question that, on construction. I think there's a question from Pablo Vicente. Yeah. From uh, Pablo Vicente. Uh, Anna told us in Valencia that a construction was included in Green Deal data space. Construction mean ports. I see no relationship with the Sebastian presentation or Elizabeth. Uh, please explain. I do not have the background of such uh, of such question, but uh, if you're interested, uh, I don't know if either of you have any has any input in this. I can give at least some. Uh, please, please. Yeah, so that as, as I said, I. I I just included two examples of the Green Deal uh, binding targets. And uh, the, the Green Deal potentially adapting our way of living, adapting our economy, having a circular economy will, will impact many, many uh, sectors. And uh, so typically uh, ports, roads, buildings and airports uh, they have they have also their targets in terms of uh, insulation, uh, resistance to to climate change, adaptation or mitigation to future climate condition. So in in this area, it seems uh, relatively easy to 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 imagine or to to design some some use cases or yeah that that would involve um, construction. So, but I, I I had no time to. I mean, there are so many biting. I mean, like one hundred biting targets that can, if you really develop them, that can touch many many uh, sectors of activity. So, it can be it can be studied in in other uh, in other venue like the 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 space the the stakeholder forum that that we will have can be a good place to to try to dig deeper into into those. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I see another question from the audience uh, would, would ask, would you give some insight in the business model of these two data spaces? Data spaces will rely on contribution from many data holders. How will this, um, how will this data holders be able to benefit from advancing style insights using AI and digital twins gathered by data users, such as startups? Uh, who wants to try to answer this? Yeah, I can give it a start. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the the business model as well for for the green deal data space, the the business model also need to be uh, exercised and 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 defined. But uh, but indeed, uh, it will rely on contribution from many data holders. So, what is the value that you can get from sharing more widely your data or? That you can get from accessing uh, more data. So if you share your data and it's already open, the value you can get is, let's say, 
your data is more widely used. If it is good, it will be uh, it will be recognized as a very good uh, data set. So then you can you can get indirect benefit uh, from that. Uh, if your data is uh, is commercial, uh, you it, a data space could be a way to reach to reach out more to to others. And, and also, it might be a way to reach out to, to specialists, to data analysts that will be able to make with your data what you can't do because you don't have the knowledge in-house, so that it will also be a way to, uh, to, to connect to other third-party uh, and value-added reseller that could also uh, make, make good use of your, of your data. But all this needs to be, to be well-defined. It will be a balance between publicly funded <laughs> Um, resources from the Commission, from the member states, uh, from public organizations that are already operating in that space. But what is important is that we have more engagement with the private sector and that, that can learn as well how to share their data outside of their circle, but on their own terms. They will be in charge. They will decide who can do what with their data. And maybe there they can find skills, or techniques that they don't have in-house. And then, yeah, then the benefit is, is coming, but it's it's a process, I think. I can just mention a bit, we don't have too much on this uh, already, but it's something that is a focus uh, for the pilots and a support that we will provide uh, for them in the application process and afterwards. Uh, to something that they have to consider because obviously receiving funding uh, is not enough. They have to consider the sustainability uh, also for this to continue on afterwards. So it's something that uh, will have to be included in uh, the application and something that we will support ongoing as we uh, select the pilots and uh, continue on with the, with the validation. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I'm looking again at the chat to see if there's any other question from the audience. Uh, Elizabeth posted a website, so um, everybody, the audience can also go to see the call for pilots for the data space for smart cities and communities. And the on this note, I would like to highlight, first of all, thanks to your speaker uh, for, for taking the time to come to the, to the webinar and to, to introduce us um, about the preparatory action, the, the great data space and the data space for smart communities. Thanks, Sebastian, and thanks, Elizabeth. And uh, so we, on this note, we, uh, I'd like to remind once again that the, the, the world largest event on data spaces is coming back very soon. So I'm posting here in the chat, as my colleague posted in the chat, a website for the event from the 12th to the 14th of March in Darmstadt. You, you will find sponsorship opportunities there. You will find and find more about the program, three days, both on market-ready data spaces and the alignment with the European strategy of data for the Europe, with the European Commission. So stay tuned. Thanks again for thanks again for attending. See you at the next Insight series, but most of all, see you in Darmstadt to talk about data spaces. Go, Elizabeth. I just want to make one final comment that yes, I put in the yes. chat. Um, uh, let me just find it. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we launched uh, an interactive portal uh, for building uh, data spaces in smart communities. So mm -hmm. it's live. I linked it in the chat. So please check it out if this is relevant for you. And always feel free to, to write to me a comment if uh, you want to know more about pilots or if something of this is of interest to you, then we will be happy to help. And thank you for inviting. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank Anna. you. Thank you. Yes. Ready. Just wanted to thank you for organizing. <laughs> yeah. nice. You're very welcome. So see you at the next Inside series. See you in Darmstadt. And thank you again for coming to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.